Uh, this is the exact same uh, presentation that I recently gave in India at a very interesting conference that was sort of a combination of muscle pain and fibromyalgia researchers along with occupational medicine and animal researchers. And I learned a lot. It was really fascinating. And uh, I'm happy to, I'm going to share a little bit about what I learned and then also share with you the same presentation I gave there. I do hope that today's presentation, I will be a little bit, um, a little bit less sweaty. Brief little funny story. So India is quite warm in September, quite humid. And because of visa challenges, I got there very late the night before my first presentation. Didn't have time to coordinate as far as like transportation from the hotel to uh, the conference site. So I looked on the map and I was like, oh, it's like three or four blocks. I can totally walk. So I like, I'm all dressed up and I have my makeup and I'm, I'm walking and, and it's actually more of like uh, an adventure because there's construction and I have to like route around. And I ended up getting there like just literally right before I had to go on stage. And I am drenched in sweat in a not very attractive way. And I was like, okay, no problem. I'll just go to the bathroom. I'll blot myself off, get on stage. I go to the bathroom and they actually um, don't typically use paper towels or toilet paper in India. They actually do a much more environmentally friendly approach where they use just water. Um, and so I ended up just having to go on stage, totally drenched in sweat. So I think the presentation still, I pulled it off, but today I'm happy to be coming to you from my slightly less um, humid environment. It's basically going to be the same scientific information, but because uh, I want to make sure everybody's kind of on the same page with me, I am going to do just a little bit of brief review of anatomy. So you kind of understand what I'm talking about when I'm talking about what's going on in the muscles in fibromyalgia and how we can use that information to reduce our pain. Like how can we actually use the scientific information, harness that to help ourselves feel better? Because that's really what's important. And that's probably why most of you guys are tuning in, not to hear my anecdotes about amusing sweat related incidents in India, but to actually learn like, okay, is there something here that I can use to help myself or to help my loved one? Or if you're a healthcare provider to help my patients with fibromyalgia, because I think we all recognize that there's a lot of room. There's a lot of room to improve in how we understand what's happening in fibromyalgia and how we use that information for treatment. The one thing I'm not gonna talk about today, which is also very important though, is the newer data showing the immune system's involvement in generating fibromyalgia pain. If you go to my YouTube channel, uh, I, I've got several videos there where I talk about that. And I have a recently published article where I really review like what's going on, how do we connect what we already know about what's causing pain and fibromyalgia to this new immune system data. So that is very important, very interesting, very new data. But what I'm actually gonna talk about today is something that's a little bit more concrete, a little bit more fundamental. And that is, it's our muscles that hurt in fibromyalgia, right? Like most of us recognize like, wow, my muscles are really sore. They're really tender. And actually the word fibromyalgia means fiber, so connective tissue, myo, which means muscle, and pain. So really in the very name of the condition is muscle pain. And so I think we need to understand, okay, what's actually going on? Interestingly though, the first like hmm, 30 to 40 years of research in, in fibromyalgia, although it was named for painful muscles, the very obvious muscle pathology was not there. So when initial researchers were looking like in the 70s, 80s, even the early 90s, fibromyalgia muscles appeared normal. It's only when you actually really look with a very specific lens, focusing in large part on the fascia, where you start to see those abnormalities. And that's what I want to share with you today because it's so, well, it's really interesting as a researcher, but it's also really important because we can use that information for treatment. So basic review, we're talking about myofascial pain. Myo is muscle, fascia is connective tissue. If you look at the diagram here, what we're looking at is kind of the gross anatomy of a muscle. And so a muscle has both muscle 
cells. So those are the ones that actually like are kind of springs and contract. And then it's encased in this with this kind of connective tissue sheath that both surrounds and penetrates the muscle. And you end up with this sort of honeycomb structure, which you can see on the right there. And then you can see on the left here, this is actually um, a cadaver, a human muscle, where you can see the, the reddish color muscle cells, but then enveloped by this sticky honeycomb uh, web, which we call fascia. And in particular, myofascia, the muscle, the fascia surrounding the muscles. So that was a very long introduction to explain what I'm going to be talking about, which is really what's going wrong, what's the pathology in fibromyalgia muscles and fibromyalgia fascia, or another way to say it is myofascial pathology. That's kind of the essence of what I'm going to talk about. This is the same kind of uh, honeycomb structure. This time we're looking at a cross section. And you can see uh, muscle cells surrounded by different um, connective tissue surroundings. And it just kind of is basically showing the different, um, the close relationship between both the muscle cells and the connective tissue that surrounds each muscle cell. The final little piece of anatomy I want to talk about, just so you can uh, better understand what, what I'm discussing, is the sympathetic nervous system versus the parasympathetic. Sympathetic, fight or flight, it's like the cat with the, that kind of reaction at the top there, versus the parasympathetic nervous system, or rest and digest. And why, why do I bring this up? It's because it's fundamental in understanding why we have so much pathology in our muscles and connective tissue. Sidebar, it actually is also really related, in my opinion, to the immune system abnormalities that we see in fibromyalgia and kind of the newer data. But as I said, not going to talk about that today. So this slide basically sums up this whole presentation. And if you like walk away from my talk today, these are the four things I want you to really understand about what's happening in the muscle, what's going wrong in the fibromyalgia muscle. And then later on, I'm gonna talk about what we can do to improve this, to lessen our pain, to lessen our inflammation. So in fibromyalgia, and I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth into each of these, but just really broadly, in fibromyalgia, we have pathologic levels of muscle tension. Muscle tension that is so intense that it actually causes tissue dysfunction. It's this, Muscle tension is so intense that our muscles actually show signs of metabolic stress, of oxidative stress, which basically means the oxidative stress means the body's not able to clear some of the normal, um, kind of some of the normal metabolic um, markers that typically. So, with normal metabolism, we create reactive oxygen species, and then we have antioxidants, which we naturally produce to reduce them. In fibromyalgia, the balance is off, and we have this excess of toxicity in the muscles. These pathologically tense muscles have more trigger points. I'll go into what those are. And we also see in our fascia, that connective tissue surrounding and penetrating the muscles, increased collagen deposition and inflammatory markers. So to review, pathologic muscle tension, markers of inflammation, metabolic stress, trigger points, and some increased inflammation and collagen or fibrosis in the fascia, okay? So I know your head might be a little swimming right now, but I'm gonna go into each of these pieces and they're actually pretty simple to understand. And what it comes down to is, our muscles are not designed to be tense all the time. So this is one of my kind of favorite quotes from a research article that I've, one of my favorite quotes I've ever read um, about what's happening in the body in fibromyalgia. We have relentless sympathetic hyperactivity in fibromyalgia. So if you recall the cat image, right? The fight or flight activation, that is running the show in fibromyalgia. And what we think happens is in genetically predisposed individuals, a trauma or an illness, something triggers the alarm, the danger response to be activated in fibromyalgia. And the abnormal part is it doesn't get deactivated. And so whatever way you look at measuring fight or flight nervous system activity or sympathetic nervous system activity in fibromyalgia, whether it's with a tilt table test, a heart rate variability, um, 
measuring actually the electrical activity from sympathetic nerves into the muscle. Whichever way you measure it in fibromyalgia, it's all abnormal. It all shows relentless sympathetic hyperactivity. And anybody who's living in a fibromyalgia body, that can kind of resonate. And you can, I remember feeling like when I was kind of trying to figure out what was happening in my body before I even had a diagnosis of fibromyalgia, I remember feeling like, why do my muscles never relax? Why do I always feel unsafe? Why can my body, like I, even if my brain, I was like, I, there's no danger around, I should feel perfectly relaxed. My body felt tight all the time. And when I woke up in the morning, it felt like I'd been like clenching and, uh, you know, I was literally ready to like fight or flee all night long. That is, in my mind, kind of the primary driver of all the downstream abnormalities of fibromyalgia. But when we're talking about pain, the biggest challenge is muscles are not designed to be tight all the time. It makes sense that we would want our muscles to contract and be tight temporarily when the fight or flight nervous system is activated, right? Good in the short term, bad in the long term. Good in the short term because let's say, and every once in a while there'll be like a story in the in the news about, you know, many years ago there was a story in Colorado about a, a woman who, you know, weighed like 120 pounds who was able to fight off a mountain lion who was attacking one of her kids, right? And I was like, well, how could how could she do that? Well, when the fight or flight nervous system is intensely activated really quickly, we get this contraction of our muscles and this kind of increased strength to fight off a mountain lion or whatever we're fighting. Off. But if it happens all the time, it's detrimental to the muscle. And we can see this both in animal models and in humans. So when they take poor little rats and mice, I feel terrible for these rats and mice that they subject to this like prolonged stressful stimuli, what they start seeing is they actually develop painful muscles. Their muscles hurt. And that part of the, the development of this muscle pain is related to some of the chemicals secreted in the fight or flight nervous system, like epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, right? So what we know is that the chemicals of the fight or flight nervous system generate muscle tension. And if that happens for too long, that leads to muscle pain. Does that sound familiar for anybody who is dealing with fibromyalgia? Like, I think most of us would probably say like, yeah, well, yes, that does, that does sound familiar. When they look at other ways of measuring muscle activity in fibromyalgia, like looking at electrical activity with uh, EMGs, what they see is that our muscles actually not only show tightness, but when we attempt to relax them, like attempt to consciously relax our muscles, we can't get quite to normal relaxation. They're unable to reach a full relaxation. And one of the articles I read described the muscle pattern in fibromyalgia as being similar, like the electrical muscle pattern of fibromyalgia, as being similar to some of the rigid tight muscles that we see in things like Parkinson's disease. So this is important to remember when we're thinking about like, why do my muscles hurt? Well, they're really tight and they're really tight in a way that is kind of beyond our conscious control. And we can't just sort of tell ourselves like, okay, I'm going to relax my muscles. And even with kind of body attempts, whether it's with deep breathing, things like that, even with our very best efforts, our muscles can't ever quite reach normal relaxation. This doesn't mean that we can't make really good efforts and make improvement in our muscle tension. I just kind of want people to understand like there really is something going on in our muscles and that that plays a huge role. I think a really huge role in what generates fibromyalgia pain and also how we can best address it, frankly. If you were to imagine the fibromyalgia muscle as a basketball, let's say, and if you were to use a pressure gauge needle, you know, they, they will insert, they'll insert like a needle inside a, a basketball or, you know, other sports ball or whatever to see like how, how, what the, the air pressure is in there, whether you need to like inflate it or deflate it. You can actually use pressure gauge needles to see what the um, pressure is inside a muscle. They've done some really interesting studies looking at comparing kind of healthy controls to fibromyalgia muscles, and also comparing not healthy controls, people that have like rheumatoid arthritis, but no fibromyalgia, to fibromyalgia. And what they've found is the pressure inside our muscles 
is up to three times normal. So we have almost triple the pressure or the tension inside our muscles. Muscles don't like being tense. Muscles don't like having increased pressure. And so the other thing we see in fibromyalgia muscles are proteins that are associated with muscle damage, proteins associated with oxidative stress. So sort of an imbalance between kind of the toxic metabolites that we're not able to uh, no normally process. So a buildup of toxic metabolites in, in the muscles, along with decreased energy molecules. So reduced ATP has been shown in fibromyalgia muscles. And basically, the more of these um, inflammatory markers, oxidative stress markers, and kind of reduced energy that you see in the fibromyalgia muscle, the worse those markers are, the worse pain levels are. Makes sense, right? So what we have in fibromyalgia are muscles that are very tight and unhappy. And tight and unhappy muscles generate pain and generate inflammation. They also are really prone to developing these hyper irritable knots called trigger points. And they've done a lot of different studies kind of comparing, well, how many trigger points does the average person, average healthy person have? And then they've looked at it in like fibromyalgia, low back pain, you know, localized myofascial pain. And what they found is that the fibromyalgia muscle is basically riddled with trigger points, riddled with these knots. And the knots themselves then generate more pain and more dysfunction. Picture a sweater that has like a knit sweater that has like a snag in it. And then that snag is not only going to affect right around the sweater, you're going to see it pulling in other areas. So what you see with trigger points is they not only affect locally the muscle, they also affect distant areas. And interestingly, the tighter the fibromyalgia muscle is, the more likely it is to have trigger points. And on average, if you count, do like a body count, people with fibromyalgia have an average of 10 to 11 trigger points. Healthy controls have zero to one. Significant difference, right? So I think you can see from everything I've talked about that the muscle in fibromyalgia is definitely not normal. And you can see how it would be a significant contributor to pain. So we've been talking about like the muscle tissue itself. And now I'm going to talk more about like the fascia, the connective tissue around, around the muscle. Now, of course, you can't really separate the two. It's actually like one big network. So you can't really separate the muscle cells and the, the fascial tissue. But for sort of the, the purposes of discussion, we, we do separate them. And when we're looking at uh, fascial inflammation in, in the fibromyalgia muscle, what we're looking at is actually like the area around the pink part here. So the area in between. And this is the area that we call the fascia. And the fascia is uh, made up of cells called the fibroblasts. It also has collagen and extracellular matrix. I like to think about it though like a spider web. And any of any of you who have walked into a spider web know how incredibly sticky they are. And that's what the fascia does. It sticks things together. It's like glue. And unhealthy fascia is extra sticky, has extra glue. And that's what we see in fibromyalgia, we have extra sticky, extra inflamed fascial tissue. And so they've done a couple of interesting biopsy studies. And uh, what they found is an increase in the collagen surrounding the muscle cells in fibromyalgia patients. And in a different study, so on the top here, these are the fibromyalgia muscle biopsies. On the bottom, they're comparing it to healthy controls. And in each of these tops images here, they're staining for a different, um, a different component of the fascia. So one of them stains for collagen, and then they're staining for some immune kind of immune markers and markers of inflammation. If you just take a step back though and look, you can really see the difference between the top images and the bottom, right? In the fascial area there, there's a lot more spider web. There's a lot more of the, the sticky inflamed uh, components of, of the fibromyalgia fascia. And this is the piece that is really understudied. And we really need to look a lot more into what is happening in the fascia and fibromyalgia. It's a little bit hard to get funding for this type of research. 
it's mostly done on, on animals, uh, but these human studies, I think, are really important so that we can actually, like, I'd love to do more of these biopsy studies with some of the newer um, newer science that we have so that we could further delineate what's what's happening. And I would happily volunteer my fascia for that. Like, take, take my thigh muscle, totally fine. I, I really want, we need to know more. And then hopefully that will help us to develop some treatments. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some of the new treatments I learned about, potential treatments I learned about in India. So stay tuned. I alluded to this earlier, but why does it matter if our fascia has extra sticky tissue in it, extra collagen? First of all, it's not going to work as well. It's going to be more prone to developing uh, trigger points. It's going to be more prone to developing pain. And actually, the connective tissue, the fascia, is the part of the muscle where most of the pain sensing nerves reside. Not only do pain sensing nerves reside there, nerves of the sympathetic nervous system primarily reside in the fascia in our muscles. So you have this interplay where you have intense fight or flight sympathetic nervous system activity coming into the fascia, contracts it. Then you have contracted, unhappy, inflamed, sticky fascial tissue that just happens to have a whole bunch of pain sensing nerves. That right there can really explain why it is our, our myofascial tissue that hurts so much in fibromyalgia. And this is just really interesting to me. We know that muscle cells can contract, but what we're actually learning is that the fascial cells can contract as well in response to sympathetic nervous system activity. So we think that why that uh, mother can fight off the mountain lion is because not only does that sympathetic nervous system activity tell her muscles to contract, the actual fascia around the muscles also contracts and you get this extra contraction. And that's what gives you this sort of very temporary boost in, in you can get to kind of superhuman strength temporarily. So what we have in fibromyalgia are superhuman strong muscles that are just, they've worked, they've just been doing that for 20 years, right? So they're inflamed and they're tired and they're painful. But you can think about it as your own superpower, right? Like, in fact, our muscles are quite strong, but unfortunately that is working against us because they're not designed to be contracted like that all the time. So guess what we need to do to reduce our pain? We need to reduce the tension and inflammation in our myofascial tissue. So what are some ways that we can do that? Well, we could work on the source of the problem, which is that overactive fight or flight response. And there are ways that we can do that for ourselves. And uh, that is our, our other superpower is that we can trigger our own relaxation response, which is the opposite, the opposite of the fight or flight nervous system response. So there's some simple ways to do this, even just deep, slow belly breaths, gentle exercise, all the annoying things that like we know we're supposed to be doing, but are actually kind of hard to make happen when you don't feel well, guided relaxation, meditation, mindfulness, biofeedback, and anything that activates the vagus nerve, which is kind of the the highway of the relaxation response. And it goes right in the back of our throat. So things like singing, gargling, even, I don't like doing this, but um, you can actually, if you gag yourself, it actually activates the parasympathetic nervous system. So I had a, I had a naturopath that was, gosh, it was like 20 years ago when I was first kind of trying to find ways to help myself with fibromyalgia. And uh, he said, okay, every night when you're brushing your teeth, like gag yourself. And I was like, um, <laughs> I don't really like that advice. But what's really interesting, and maybe try this tonight if you feel like it, um, if you don't have a super sensitive gag response, so you don't like barf on your toothbrush, but just very gently, what it does is it briefly activates our relaxation response. And it's weird, but you'll actually feel a little bit of like a, like a muscle relaxation afterwards. There's many more pleasant ways to do it. Um, but suffice it to say that anything that we can do to activate our relaxation response, even temporarily, the more often we do it, the better our muscles are going to feel, okay? There's not a way, unfortunately, that we can permanently, at this point, we don't know a way to permanently deactivate the fight or flight nervous system response that we see in fibromyalgia to get us back to sort of the normal 
balance, but there's a lot of ways that we can temporarily at activate our relaxation response. And the more often we do that, the better we and our muscles will feel. And there's a whole, actually two chapters in the fibro manual devoted to these, these topics and more. Another way we can do it, and this is a much more pleasant way than gagging yourself, is to get manual therapy. So using either our own hands or devices to help reduce the tension in our muscles or a therapist hands or tools helping us. Okay. And most people with fibromyalgia, because their muscles hurt, have actually tried massage therapy or chiropractic, or uh, we're kind of drawn to that because it's like, well, my muscles are really tight and painful. And, and we want something that will, like we're instinctively drawn to something that will help ease that muscle tension or pain. However, we're all kind of every every massage therapist or manual therapist has a slightly different approach and we're all different in how our body receives that. One of the commonalities though that we see is that typically Swedish massage is the least well tolerated of manual therapies in fibromyalgia. And it Swedish massage is really more of the the kneading or stroking um what we kind of typically think of as massage that tends to, uh, in many cases, kind of flare people up. We tend to respond better to therapies that are focused on the fascia. And uh, I'll go briefly into what those look like as well. But uh, I will say that what the studies show really plays out in what my patients tell me and what I personally experience. So many, many years ago, when I first developed fibromyalgia in medical school, my muscles hurt and were tense. So I sought all sorts of different types of manual therapy, primarily Swedish massage. And it was so frustrating because it made me feel worse. But I kept thinking like, well, it's just inflammation or, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know why it wasn't working. And I also didn't really know what else to try. So I tried all sorts of different therapists and styles. And, and it wasn't until I stumbled into myofascial release. And that was about two years into my journey. That was literally the first time that I experienced any reduction in pain. And I was like, holy, sh pardon my French, but what this is so, it was so different than any massage or manual therapy I'd experienced as far as what it felt like when I was getting it. And oh my goodness, the results were so different. And that's actually what set my whole kind of career trajectory as far as like my interest in the fascia, what's happening in the fascia and fibromyalgia, why I feel like myofascial release is such a huge key or, or other therapies that work on the fascia. And I really honestly credit it with my ability to have a medical career. Like I didn't feel like I was going to be able to, I had taken a year leave of absence. And it wasn't until I found my myofascial release that I felt like I could improve enough to get back to medical school. So you can see it's like close to my, close to my heart. And you, if you look at the fibro manual, or if you were a patient of mine, you know that I, I talk about the fascia a lot. I recommend myofascial release. It's, it's so vital, but not everybody has access to a myofascial release therapist. So the good news is there are ways we can work. We can give ourselves myofascial release. Really briefly, a review looking at all sorts of different manual therapy approaches for fibromyalgia. Guess what they found? Myofascial release presented the best evidence of effectiveness and could be preferred over other styles. So, okay, yeah, science is backing up. I love it when the science backs up what I, <laughs> what happened, you know, personally with me, because then you don't just have to listen to, to me. I, I certainly want to be able to provide evidence-based medicine and I want to be able to want to be able to show both patients and ultimately like insurance companies like hey there's actually like a reason why you should pay for myofascial release for my patients I digress so what is myofascial release it basically is prolonged assisted stretching and we're talking prolonged like three to five minutes Another way to think about it is like manual traction. So I wish I had, I need to get like a, a video it would be much better than seeing these still images. But in the image on the top there, if you imagine the hand, the therapist's hands on the woman's shoulder, that would be gently pushing away from the therapist and the therapist hands underneath the, the back of the woman's skull there in the occipital region, that would be gently pulling towards the therapist. So like a really slow, like, 
pulling away. And we're talking three to five minutes slow because it takes that long for the fascia to relax. And remember, the fascia is really strong. It's really dense. A collagen fibril, so one little string of collagen, is as strong as the same caliber of steel. Okay, so we have literal steel that is tightened up. And so you can see just trying to knead the steel isn't going to work. What actually helps is gently pulling it apart until the collagen crosslinks can break up. That is why myofascial release is so key. Running out of time, so I will just suffice it to say that there's been some really good studies looking at myofascial release for fibromyalgia. They all show benefit. And what's really cool is that they show benefit that persists. So at the end of 20 weeks, right at the end of the, the treatment, patients describe benefit, but then they still had pain reduction a month later. So there was actually some sustained benefit, which is really exciting. That's what this says. And then we've actually looked at it at myofascial release in animal models. And part of why I put this slide here is because I think it is so adorable to think about like these, these therapists trying to give like tiny little myofascial release stretches to animals. Um, but basically what they found is that uh, it, in lab rats, when they actually artificially artificially cause fibrosis or adhesions or extra stickiness in their, their fascia, if they then work on the sticky fascia with just a few simple techniques, seven days, once daily, it actually had an anti-inflammatory effect on the fascia and improved the, the stickiness. So as I promised, this is also something you can do yourself. So there's some great books and videos about myofascial stretching. There's some tools that you can use. Cranial cradle is one of my favorite ones. I took it to India and Egypt and was very useful. Basically, it's a pretty soft um, device and, and you lay back on it. You can use it in lots of different body areas. But what you do is you try to give yourself that gentle stretching for three to five minutes. That's really what it comes down to. And uh, foam rollers can be really helpful. And in that case, you know, a lot of us are really forward. Um, you know, if you're doing computing or just with the tension of fibromyalgia kind of pulls us forward. So doing like body opening or chest opening techniques can be incredibly helpful and reduce pain. And actually, you don't have to just take my word for it. A study on uh, self myofascial release and fibromyalgia also found benefit. And uh, it was only I mean, it's a lot actually, but two 50 minute sessions a week of patients working on themselves using a variety of tools and they showed significant improvement. So it doesn't have to be, you know, every day. I try to, honestly, my goal is to try to do five minutes of self myofascial release care a day. Like that's it. If I skip that, I definitely notice the difference and it, it, it can, it doesn't have to be huge. But I think the care and feeding of our own fascia is something that we really need to learn about and know how to do in fibromyalgia. I plan to make some videos about that going forward. Trigger point injections are also ways that um, providers can help us. It just kind of, the, it's actually the physical um, insertion of the needle helps break up some of those the sticky, sticky areas, the sticky knots. And then there's some really cool self treatment for trigger points. This Thumby, you can like suction to the wall and it's really nice to like lean up and break up some of the, the trigger point pain. Dental stretching has also shown benefit for fibromyalgia and yoga. All those things that we kind of talked about, if you recall in the slide about how to activate our relaxation response. What's really cool is that things that like you can get kind of a two for one if you're doing something that both helps, helps to induce a relaxation response and also is gently stretching the fascia. That is a really magic combination, I think. So that's where I think things like certain styles of yoga can be so helpful or um, kind of mindful exercise. So gentle stretching with some deep breathing. And then no fibromyalgia presentation is complete without saying, darn it, exercise is helpful. It's just hard to get ourselves to do that if we're feeling terrible. Um, I think even sometimes just gentle gentle stretching is is enough exercise for us. But if you do a little bit of gentle stretching, 
and then just incrementally increase and do gentle exercise. All sorts of studies, I mean, like literally over 200 different studies have shown that all types of exercise are helpful. And I think where health coaches actually can be really helpful, physical therapists is in, in helping us find ways to actually incorporate that into our lives. And uh, there's actually a whole chapter in the fiber manual devoted to that as, as well. I don't think I forgot anything in what I wanted to talk about. I am I am definitely happy to answer answer questions. Um, I will say that both in the Fibro Manual and on my YouTube channel, people with fibromyalgia tend to be really, unfortunately, tend to need to become experts in fibromyalgia because most likely their doctor or health care provider is not. And so a huge aspect of what I feel like my mission is, is to try to educate both patients and providers on what's going on in our body. If we have that knowledge, we can empower ourselves with that knowledge to either guide our providers to help us or use that information on our own to help ourselves. Because sadly, that is really the, the position that we are in. Oh, I know what I forgot to say. I wanted to say what I learned in India. Remember I was talking about how, how there's extra fibrosis or extra collagen, extra sticky connective tissue in, in fibromyalgia, that that's a big part of our muscle pathology. There was a very cool, badass female research scientist there named Mary Barb, B-A-R-B-E, um, from Temple University. And she does primarily animal research. And she's actually an occupational medicine researcher. And she looks at how to prevent repetitive stress injuries. And part of what generates repetitive stress injuries is, wait for it, fibrosis. So she has been looking at all sorts of different ways, like how can we prevent the repetitive stress injuries that basically she induces repetitive stress injuries in, in these mice and then tries sees what, what helps. And there is a really specific drug that is in development that actually seems to block the unhealthy laying down of collagen, but not the healthy laying down. And that could be like a really big game changer in fibromyalgia because the problem is collagen is in every tissue, right? So if we just give a medication like, okay, let's block collagen. Well, it's going to block the healthy collagen that we need for like, you know, basic functioning. Collagen is kind of the biggest structural molecule in the body. But if we can figure out a way to block the unhealthy collagen deposition, that could be a huge game changer. The other reason why I think she is just so cool is because she shows one of the things she's looked at is actually like myofascial release or massage for these mice. And so she showed videos of these mice getting massages like in the lab. And it was just like, God, it was the cutest thing I've ever seen. And it slightly made me feel better for all the like, you know, we we put we put mice and rats through so much in the name of science. And I wish there was a way we could do science differently that didn't do that. But I would have I wanted to be a mouse in her laboratory because she treats them amazingly. She like gives them, you know, little treats and tells them she loves them and gives them little massages. And they were just like the happiest, most blissed out mice you've ever seen. And I would like all of us with fibromyalgia to be as happy as those blissed out mice. So with that, that's what I wanted to say. I'm glad I remembered that.